formerly from Pakistan. He's been living in the United States for 15 years. For the past 15 years, he's been an active member of the peace movement in the United States. He was on trial with the Berrigans in Harrisburg as part of the Harrisburg Eight. He is now a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., and spends much of, his, much of his time writing about international relations and strategic weapons in the third world. That's, I think, enough. Ethbal Ahmed. How much time should I take? 20 minutes? Sure. Okay. I'm delighted to be with you here tonight. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. If you have difficulty hear me, hearing me, please holler. I do not know where to begin tonight. And how to end tonight. I had come with a relatively prepared speech, and whenever I do that, I normally talk for about an hour and a half. <laughs> but Lisa has told me I should speak for 20 heroic minutes, and I have got a problem. <laughs> so I shall junk this speech I brought with me, and you will forgive me tonight, for tonight I am going to ramble. And ramble, I hope, not for more than 20 minutes. Lisa, please stop me when I have passed my time. I should perhaps begin by saying that in the course of this evening, I would say a few things that are harsh, and some of you may disagree with my judgment, but if you do, please understand that I do so with a cry of my anguish and a cry of my love. For among you, I have lived a very long time, a stranger. But I have been with you for a long time and will be with you for a long time. Because we live in a world where all forms of freedom are interrelated. And we live in a world which for the first time, I think in the known history of humankind, faces an absolutely new kind of challenge. And it is a challenge not merely of war, not merely of making peace, but a challenge, literally, of human survival. And the reason I say it's a challenge of survival is something very simple. And it is at that level of simplicity that I wish to talk with you. And the simple fact is, that for 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years of the known history of mankind, there have been wars. And there has been a constant yearning for peace. And in this history of 3,000 years of warfare as a reality, and peace as an aspiration, we know one fact as a historical, simple fact, namely, each time a major technological breakthrough has occurred in the weapon of warfare, the possessors of that particular weapon have argued that this is the final weapon to stop the last war. And each time we know that never in the history of humankind have a weapon been developed that has ultimately not been used. And this very simple fact of history should be remembered. 
The difference, however, in the second half of the 20th century is that the weapons that have now been discovered is not merely the sword. It is not just the gunpowder. It is not even the aircraft. Between the Crimean War and World War I, you will remember, there was a great deal of debate that air forces should be developed or should not be developed as a weapon of warfare. And they argued, yes, it should be developed, but it will be a weapon of deterrence and not of operation. But then came World War I and the bombings began. Air Force was used. And in World War II, it was used to the extent that you saw the fire bombings of Bremen. And you ultimately saw that Air Force deliver the ultimate beginnings of the ultimate weapon in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the first very simple principle that we must remember is that weapons, when they have been developed, have been argued as weapons of peace that will finally prevent humanity from fighting anymore, weapons of final deterrence, and they have always come to be used. Second simple principle is that we cannot afford to have this one used. So this is the ultimate one. There are right now 60,000 of these weapons. You have heard these figures. And these 60,000 weapons throughout the world, the atomic weapons I'm talking about, have the capacity together one and a quarter million times the capacity of the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. There's the capacity to dry, destroy all of us, the whole world, about 10 times over, or possibly more. Therefore, we have a very special calling. And the calling to abolish the weapons altogether rather than to put special controls on their use. I want to make a second point. And the second point I want to make is, I know these defendants for a long time. Very briefly, I want to go at it. Sometimes, at the beginning of 73 and 74, when they were going into these acts of civil disobedience, I had wondered if this was the right thing to do. I had wondered if it was the right way to go about stopping the arms race. And after five years of agonizing, I frankly stand here to tell you that after asking a lot of questions, I have come to believe that these people are following one of the few decent roads available to stopping these weapons, to abolishing this kind of weapons. I want to say two things in that regards, and then I'll move quickly to the international strategic political questions about which I know most. But first, two simple points. These men and women walked in there, and they did something that the media generally, a lot of liberals who are against atomic weapons, and a hell of a lot of conservatives of the moral majority talk of this moral minority as if they are crazies. And I am going to ask a question of you and would try to answer that question tonight as rationally as I can, whether these human beings are crazy or somebody else has gone bananas. <laughs> No, I will ask that question rationally. I'm sorry I wouldn't have the, all, all the time we need to answer that, but I'll come back to you some other day. First, I would like to note that the craziness of which they are being considered guilty is the kind of craziness that this country has known for a very long time. 
And in fact, it is the kind of craziness that this country has known for a very long time as the only, the primary at least, the main vehicle of social change and social movements. We live in a country which is the only country in the Western world today that literally lives functionally in a one-party system. It's the only country that has neither a suppressed nor a functioning opposition party. And when you live in a country that calls itself democratic, that has neither a functioning nor a repressed opposition party, one of the few means that the citizens have to get heard is to enter into acts of civil disobedience. And it is for that reason, it is for that particular phenomenon of American political culture that acts of civil disobedience have become a major, a mainstream, a decisive part of the political life of America since the days that a party was held in Boston and it was called the Boston Tea Party. And it is for this reason that the trade union movement in this country had to go through acts of civil disobedience. And it is for this reason that the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King had to go into acts of civil disobedience. And it is for this reason that the, that, 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 that the suffragettes had to enter into acts of civil disobedience. And it is for this reason that we had to enter into acts of civil disobedience to stop the war in Indochina. It is not the Congress of America that has stopped the war in Indochina. It was the war demonstrations in Pentagon. It was the burning of the Catonsville Nine Files. It was the nuns and priests going into jail. It was the Chicago Seven trial. It was the demonstrations of 1968 before the Democratic Convention in Chicago. So since when has which part of mainstream America come to describe acts of civil disobedience as un-American acts? These acts, civil disobedience, is as American as apple pie. <laughs> and for God's sake, I mean, examine the history of your own country. This has been a primary vehicle of social change in this country. I have just given you a quick rundown. So let's go on to the next one. Are these particular activists of civil disobedience a bit crazy? Well, examine the situation. I would say, no, they are not crazy, as Robert Aldridge has already testified, and I would like to point out to you. We not only have to live under the shadow of nuclear weapons, but a very momentous change occurred in nuclear strategy of the superpowers of the world, namely the United States and the Soviet Union, sometime in the 70s. So that is a point to constantly remember. I can't go into details of it, but I'll point out to you its main outlines. Sometime in the late 1960s, the United States government had begun to fully an establishment realize that one of the many factors that had defined America's supremacy after World War II as the number one power of the world was its attainment of a strategic superiority over any power or group of powers in the world. By a strategic superiority, I mean the possession of and the delivery capability on nuclear weaponry. By 1900, between 1965 and 1968, however, its rival power, the Soviet Union, had also caught up to develop equal type of capabilities. Equal not in quantity, but in qualitative terms, with the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles and the Polaris submarine systems. The Soviets were coming close to developing their own Trident system, haven't quite done it fully. At this point then, the doctrine of massive retaliation the doctrine of massive retaliation, whose theory, whose philosophy was, whose theory was, there's no philosophy here, 
it's all theoretical, it's all tactical, basically. The strategic doctrine was that if any power or group of power attacks the United States, American weaponry would be so geared and was so geared that it will retaliate immediately so heavily that the other power, the attacking power, will be destroyed. That's called massive retaliation. When the Soviets developed their own weaponry, massive retaliation began to be viewed as a situation of mutual assured mutual assured uh, destruction. They called it mad. From mad, therefore, it produced, the situation of mad produced a new kind of theoretical madness in people like Henry Kissinger, Tom Schelling, Zbigniew Brzezinski, etc. Their argument was that once the Soviets have become equals, a balance of terror has been achieved. And once a balance of terror has been achieved, a balance of power politics is not possible. Because as Dr. Henry Kissinger argued in his writings, a balance of power politics is, was based on the premise that you have to have the threat and use of force. So that you have the threat and use of force that serves as the balancing mechanism. If you don't have the balancing mechanism, you don't have a balance of power politics. And thermonuclear war now, mutual assured destruction, has made diplomacy impossible. Therefore, we have to do two things. We have to make nuclear weapons in such a way that it becomes a credible weapon, a credible instrument of diplomacy. And you do that by doing two things. One, acquire a first strike capability over the other enemy. And the second thing that you do is you lower the threshold on the use of tactical, on the use of nuclear, level, nuclear weapons in situations of limited wars. Hence, the introduction of mini nukes, tat nukes, and uh, uh, neutrons, and so on. The first set of strategic doctrine was called the first strike capability, what Aldrich talks about a great deal and knows a lot about, is the first strike capability, the counterforce capability. The second was the flexible targeting options. It was on March 3rd, 1973, that Jessinger, then Defense Secretary, announced the making of the new American nuclear doctrine. An entire strategic situation that had existed in the world since the explosion of the Hiroshima bomb had been completely transformed into a new phenomenon. A new type of arms race had then begun. A new willingness to use nuclear weapons in situations of limited wars had been developed. And the Soviet Union, within about a year and a half's time, had followed suit. What is very frightening, ladies and gentlemen, is that with the exception of a few people, very, very few people, the Berrigans were among them. Very few people noticed it. The newspapers have not discussed this momentous shift in American nuclear doctrine and, Ameri and, and, and Russian response to it. And therefore, the risk has gone unnoticed. And it is, you will notice that the Berrigan's acts of civil disobedience on the nuclear issue began after that moment. Point I'm making, and I'm coming very close to finishing my time, is that we have now a new situation in which the nuclear doctrines, the strategic doctrines of the United States, an immediate response to that from the Soviet Union, is such that the threshold on the use of the weapons have been lowered with the flexible targeting options. And the temptation to striking first has also been increased by the adoption of the counterforce strategy. So keep this in mind. Keep a second thing in mind. Part of this environment is the fact that the establishment of the greatest power in the world is trying to restore and revive, essentially, what was an illusion. The illusion of the lost American century. 
You see, after World War I, after World War II, the United States emerged as a very major superpower. And that emergence of the United States as the world's number one superpower was hailed almost unthinkingly. Almost Pavlovian fashion was hailed by historians, no less than political scientists, no less than strategic experts and politicians of this country as the beginning of the American century. And then to their surprise, they realized that 20 years later, the century had ended. It was the shortest century in the history of the world. And for good reason. It was an illusion that they had called a century. It was an illusion because for 350 years, there had existed in the world a world political system defined by dominant paramount imperialism of Britain and then France. That particular world political system based on capitalist industrialism, which led to the colonization of three-fourths of the world by one-fourth of the world, the colonization of the three-fourths of the world by one-fourth of the world lasted for 300 years and ultimately completely broke down as a result of a fight between the colonial haves and the colonial have-nots. Fascism emerged in those countries of Europe which did not have large colonies, namely Germany and Italy. And they, in a battle with the colonial haves, destroyed themselves. America emerged as the superpower on the ruins of a world political system that had lasted for 300 years. Now, to be a king in the ruins is not a big thing. <laughs> and it was not going to last. But for that particular period, you had a situation in which your bureaucracy, your national security bureaucracy, multiplied by 20 times. No, more than that, 200 times. Your military industrial complex grew, your economy grew, etc., etc. But now that is over. And it is that artificial time that President Reagan and President Carter and President Johnson and President Nixon have tried to somehow stay. This is a big power, a major giant, the possessor of the largest amount of nuclear weapons is trying then to stay the course of history, to stay the natural course of history, the flow of water, the flow of air, the flow of money the flow of power. And in an effort to do so, they will not succeed. They cannot. It is out of question. They have to look towards a different kind of world. And the fear is that if they don't succeed, they can do something stupid. They can do something crazy. And that is something you should keep in mind. My third point, and I'll finish. There are tripwires. Trip wires that you must watch out for. Because again, if you remember the history of warfare throughout mankind's history, it has always started, all big wars had had small beginnings. Just as all big movements had had small beginnings. It starts somewhere with an invasion on Czechoslovakia with an assassination in the Balkans, with a taking of hostages in Karania, or what have you, etc. Today, we live in a world which is full of cake powders. It is full of spark points, tripwise. And right there, when it begins, it can produce the confrontation. When a confrontation comes, you have now a doctrine that says we will make nuclear weapons a credible weapon instrument of diplomacy. So you make the first move. They will start with a mini nuke. When that doesn't work, one goes into the attack nuke. When that doesn't work, one goes into the flexible targeting options, which the scenarios are Moscow for New York City. I don't know what's the equivalent for poor Norris Town, but does it matter? <laughs> Radiation will take care of that. <laughs> Tripwires are Central America, 
the Middle East, South Africa. Now look at Central America, and I shall end there right now. We have a struggle going on in El Salvador. For two years now, we have known, we have learned that there in El Salvador exists a murderous military junta whose security forces have terrorized their citizens, who have killed 9,000 people, 90% of whom are victims of the police security forces, often in the guise of private armies, where nuns and priests have been murdered and raped, where bishops have been killed, where not a single person will stand up to you and say, this is a government that we support. Where only two weeks ago, a civil rights worker who talked to the in National Educational Television Channel 13 in New York City, as soon as the program was shown, 24 hours later, he was murdered. Now we are being told by Mr. Ronald Reagan that Cuba is responsible, that Soviet Union is responsible, that Vietnam is responsible. And they are saying, we are not going to get into Vietnam. We are going to teach a lesson to Cuba. So what are they going to do, blockade Cuba? When they blockade Cuba, they expect the Soviet Union to back out and for Reagan to explain victory. What happens if the Soviet leader doesn't back out? What happens if the, if the, if the, if the, if the, if the, if the repressed angers, the, 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 the extraordinary poverty, the extraordinary suffering of this Alpha Salvadoran people cannot be suppressed by Cuban speeches or Cuban advice? You're going to blow us up. 